So we've been working with this model problem, and by the end of the course uh, class today, I'll kind of show you why this problem is the one we picked to continuously work with. if you don't realize it already. This time we're going to look at it subject to the von Neumann or the natural boundary conditions. So that is And this equation has the weak form. We've derived it before. These aren't. And if we write it in that special way, the bilinear form, we have that. When we write in the bilinear form, we group all terms that have both del u and u together. And then all terms of only del u. And then we solve this variational problem. And then last time, we started to talk about shape functions. And the reason we did that is because we want to build a finite element model, which has a systematic way of developing the interpolation scheme. And we used examples of linear and quadratic interpolants. But what about cubic or higher order, right? So what we want to write down today is a generic formulation such that it's, it's generic in that we don't have to a priori know exactly what type of interpolation scheme that we want to use, okay? So in that, what I mean by that is that we want to assume a displacement field that's approximately equal to sum over j from 1 to n, nj, uj, where we haven't necessarily defined n yet. Right? So they're nj shape functions of degree n minus 1. And uj are the unknown displacements that we're going to solve for. So what this element might look like we're going to have no numbers 1 and no number n on the ends but in the middle we're going to have some arbitrary number so 2 
three, four, n minus two, n minus one. All right, and these are going to be defined by the positions x two. X3, Xn minus 2, Xn minus 1. Xn. All right. And this time when we develop the weak form, we're going to integrate by parts over all of the inter intervals. So from x1 to x2, x2 to x3, xn minus 1 to xn. Right? And if we do that, we'll have that the sum from i over 1 to n minus 1. It's, so this is basically saying the sum over all the elements, right? Because there's n, if there's n nodes, there's n minus 1 elements, because the elements reside in between the nodes. Right? Um, and in this case, I'm, this is one element, but it, it's intervals, right? n minus 1 intervals, right? So then we'll integrate from xi to xi plus 1. And so if we write that out, the, the, the first term in, in, inside the integral, it's always going to be the same. And so if we sum up over all inter intervals, then what we have is x1 to xn. So here's where we're going to start seeing a difference. So today is just going to be a lot of equations. There's no way to avoid it.
All right? So I use the dot, dot, dot in the middle there to just describe all the other terms. Yeah? Um, it, it works out that way because when I do the integration by parts, right, look here. Look at this evaluation. Look at, look at the evaluation of this term, right? So when I do it for the first element, I have x1 and x2. When I do it for the first interval, right, I have x1 and x2. Then I go to the next interval, I have x2 and x3, right? But there's a sign difference because of the integration by parts, the way it works out. Yeah? Okay, this, this right here is just one element with an interpolation order of n, okay? So, I mean, it's, it's rare in practice that we go much over quadratics, especially because when you go to higher dimensions, then, then you have an element that has, you know, 24 nodes or something, and then trying to get that to conform as you put the elements together can be quite difficult. But nevertheless, w what we're showing today is just a general formulation. And then you can choose your interpolation scheme. Yeah. Sorry, when you went from the first line to the second one, yeah. on this zero equals two, mm -hmm. on the term, there's the second term, C, uh, del u, and then u, and then the second ah, you, I just missed a u. Okay. Yeah. So the, the term in, inside the integral is just repeated over every summation, right? It's just repeated. Nothing ever changes. There's no sign change or anything like that. So basically what, you know, the sum from i equals 1 to n minus 1 over all the intervals is the same thing as the integral from x1 to xn. So that's why that's just presented. So we're just going to write that a little more compactly. where q1 is equal to minus evaluated at x1, q2, This is Q3, it's Qn minus 1. All right. So I just put, described the Qs uh, as these terms. And all of the Qs on the interior, so all of these from 2 to n minus 1, 
are going to be equal to zero unless there's some externally applied force or, or source, you know, some pressure, some temperature, depending on exactly the physics that we're talking about. But unless there's some externally applied force there, they're all going to be zero. Because basically this is just a, the a continuity of ADU across the node, right? So unless I do something to, you know, we're using polynomials to interpolate, and so unless, there's going to be continuous there unless I, you know, input, input a discontinuity. So finally we have Again, this is B del U, U, and this is L del U, right? So then we equate those, and we can solve this using Ritz method. So if we let now U equal NJ, UJ, and del U, I equal N, I. So if you remember, when we first started talking about these weighted integral formulations, there were, we had described some different, you know, depending on the choice of the interpolation and the test function, you arrive at these different methods, Galerkin, Petrov Galerkin, whatever. So this is a Galerkin method where you interpolate the displacement field with some shape functions in J and you use those same, same shape functions as the test functions. Right? So this is called a Galerkin method. Or, and the fact that we're using the Galerkin method with the weak form right, is what makes it the finite element method, essentially. It's, it's you know, the Ritz method Ritz-Galerkin, I guess. So if we now plug those into the equation we had before, for I equals 1, we're going to have And likewise, for I equal 2, for I equal n, maybe I'll just write it out.
Well, this time, if you look at the equation for I equal 1, where I've written d dx nj uj, remember the uj's are just constants. They're the unknown coefficients, the unknown constants. So there's no, there's no, they're not functions of x. So we can pull them outside that differential. So I'm going to just write that as like that. So maybe I didn't need to write that out, but, but you should be able to see that for the ith equation, So here I pulled the constant uj completely outside the integral, right? So the reason that I only have a QI here is due to that partition of unity property, or the Kronecker delta property. Everybody see that? So if I have if you go back to this equation, if I have replace n with i there, so I have n i x j, well, that's going to be 1, right? If i equal to j, otherwise it's going to be 0. So this is either going to be, so when i equals to j, q j is q i, and in that case it's 1, otherwise it's 0. So the only time there'll be anything there. Yeah. Nope, just a typo. Uh oh. Uh oh. This is not good. Can't get out of here. Oh, hang on. OK. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. All right, so if you'll notice this guy, is this, then we have the constant uj there, minus 
we'll just call this fi. So we have minus fi minus qj. And that's all equal to 0. So we typically write this as kij uj. And we write this as f I. So we have the matrix equation Kij uj equals fi, or K u equals f. Why is it uj? I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. So we have this KU equals F. And we typically talk about this is the coefficient. Or in the setting of solid mechanics, this is called a stiffness matrix. In the setting of uh, porous media, it would be what? Transmissibility. Matrix. You I mean so all those names are what you might hear, right? Um, and of course, the solution to this is K inverse F. All right. So